It's kind of crazy to think that as recently as 30 years ago, if you wanted to make beer in your home, you'd have to break the law. Thankfully, in 1978, it became legal on the federal level for people to homebrew, but unfortunately, this didn't include everyone as certain states continued to restrict this natural right. But this all ended in 2013 when the last two holdouts, Mississippi and Alabama, passed laws making it okay for people to make beer at home. For the first time since Prohibition, it was legal to homebrew in all 50 of the United States. This was due in large part to the dedication and hard work of the American Homebrewers Association. In addition to continuing the fight for our right to brew, they're committed to growing the hobby by coordinating events such as Big Brew for National Homebrew Day and HomebrewCon. We're proud to say that the Brewlosophy podcast is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association and encourage all of our listeners to support the organization that has done so much for this hobby by becoming a member today. Hey, you're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, contributor Malcolm Fraser and I will be talking about an issue worried about by pretty much every professional and probably most home brewers as well. Yeah, oxidation, uh, especially on the cold side, seems to be the number one fault I find it when judging beer. And it it really is the bane of of brewers because it it can strip so much character. From hoppy beers are, are even malty beers, you know? Yeah, and, and uh, oxidation is, is kind of blamed for being the uh, kind of the, the, the having a huge impact on shelf stability um, and imparting. I think classically, you know, when I, when I first started getting into the beer evaluation and judging thing, uh, oxidation was commonly referred to as like imparting a cardboard or a wet cardboard like characteristic. Yeah, we'll get into that for sure, but it, it, that seems to be overly simplistic because it does so much more. Sometimes yeah. good, but mostly bad. Right, right, and it's you know there's there's been a lot with the with the rise of the New England IPA. There's been a lot of chat lately about oxidation and the impact it has on on beer character, not just on flavor and aroma, but also on the appearance. Um, all of that stuff we're going to get into. I think it's going to be a really interesting topic, and we've got a lot of stuff prepared to chat about. Um, we'll be getting into that in a bit. Uh, HomebrewCon 2018 is coming up in Portland. We've been talking a lot about this uh, because one, I, I really am excited for the event. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, but I also really want to encourage people who are on the fence about it uh, to go. Uh, I know you're going to be there. You've been going for a while now to HomebrewCon. Um, what, what how, how excited are you for HomebrewCon this year? Well, I'm excited for the, for the new event uh, as, as far as what's going to be featured and some of the activities we'll be doing. But just in general, I just love meeting people, uh, just your random home brewers, talking to them about what they're doing. You know, whether or not they're listeners or readers is always awesome, of course. But and meeting some of the other people that you read about, you know, from BYO or Zymergy Magazine, some of the other podcasts, I just like just like meeting people. It's yeah. all, to me, it's more about the social event now than it is the beer event. Oh, totally. I mean, it, the thing is, it is a social event that is centered around brewing beer, which, which lubricated is Lubricated like, with beer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a very socially lubricated uh, beer event. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Brewlosophy is partnering with Yakima Valley Hops, Imperial Yeast, and Mecca Great Estate Malt to bring conference goers a completely unique and uh, absolutely super duper fun experience. Um, we are, for those of, who have been to HomebrewCon before, they know that the expo is kind of what everything is centered around. Uh, it's the one thing that's happening all day long. You go and you, you get to meet all these uh, industry experts and whatnot. Well, we've decided to go in together on, I, but the AHA told us it was going to be the biggest booth uh, that they've ever done for a group. It's going to uh, be huge. It's going to be huge. <laughs> it's going to be super huge. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be recording shows live during the conference. I I've convinced Jersey and Tim to come to the event and they're going to be doing live beer reviews on the spot during the expo. Uh, we're going to get that all scheduled. So uh, mark your calendars now. It's going to be so much fun. Start planning, saving. You don't want to miss this. Trust me, it's going to be great. So Imperial is a sponsor of Brewlosophy um, and that's part of the reason we how we connected and we've decided to come together on this, uh, this homebrew con thing. Uh, they provide us with the yeast that we use for most of our brewing projects uh, that you read over at brewlosophy.com. Our decision to work with them wasn't flippant. You know, this wasn't like a haphazard decision. It was based on numerous test batches fermented with their yeast, all of which were, you know, fantastic. Um, and each pack of Imperial yeast is a pitchable rate of high quality, pure yeast cultures. Uh, over 200 billion cells, which is more than double what you'll get from most other sources. And while starters are good insurance, I've pitched direct from the pack um, many times using Imperial yeast, and it results in quick and healthy fermentation. I love this stuff. Uh, after, after using it for a year in well over 50, 
uh, 50 batches combined. Um, I think we're all mega fans of Imperial yeast. Malcolm, I know you've been using some Imperial lately. Yeah, I've been using, well, when we met them last year at Homebrew, uh, just talking to them about their quality and about their passion, which is awesome. Yeah, they are. Awesome. I mean, they are passionate about yeast. They're doing great things for homebrewers. I love that they don't just give us the scraps. They don't view homebrewers as being kind of bottom of the bucket. We're important to them. Um, so we love them. We think you will too. If you want to check out what they have to offer, you can head over to imperialyeast.com, see all the products they have available, and then you can buy their stuff at More Beer and Great Fermentations, both of which we have links to over at brewlosophy.com. Uh, I want to tell everyone the Brew Club is now live. Uh, this is a really fun group of people who have kind of coalesced uh, to bring you a, a community who enjoy questioning and experimentation when it comes to brewing and beer. They've got an official website set up now. It's thebrewclub.com. Uh, they're still working on it, but you can definitely go there and sign up to be a member, which is totally free. Again, that's thebrewclub.com. Head over there, see what they've got going on. And you can now start entering competitions under the Brew Club. I bring that up because starting tomorrow on January 23rd, uh, registration opens for the National Homebrew Competition, which is, this is the biggest homebrew comp competition in the world. I've entered it a few times. Malcolm actually took, what did you take, bronze for your, for uh, Cal Common last year? Yeah, yeah. After many years of trying, I finally got something. So next year, this year I'm hoping for a silver or a gold. We'll see. Yeah, we're all hoping for that for you. <laughs> um, and so we, we kind of had this idea for the Brew Club, given what it is that, you know, Brewlosophy kind of is known for, uh, testing the limits and, and then uh, our new short and shoddy series. We thought it'd be fun if members of the Brew Club entered a bunch of short and shoddy beers uh, into the National Homebrew Competition just to see how they fare uh, compared to other ones. Of course, you can enter any other beer that you want under the Brew Club and uh, and it'd be great to see uh, to see you guys take some medals uh, for your entries. So head over to thebrewclub.com. That's the B-R-U club.com to learn more about becoming a member. If you live anywhere near us in the following cities, we'd love to uh, have you lend your palate to our uh, style of brewing science. That'd be great. You can email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and I'll put you in touch with the contributor who you live nearest. Um, I'm right here in Fresno, California, and we've got representation in Chicago, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado, Anchorage, Alaska, Corona, California, and Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania currently, though, Malcolm, you're heading down to uh, Atlanta soon, yeah? Yeah, hopefully uh, next couple months. So we'll have representation in Atlanta and we'll have to scratch Pittsburgh off the list. But uh, if you're in Pitt Pittsburgh now or any of the other cities, let us know and we'll, we'll hook you up with a contributor. Um, if you have questions for our Brew and A episodes, which at this point, I think we're planning on releasing every 8th to 10th episode, you can email them to me, marshall at brewlosophy.com or to our feedback email, which is feedback at brewlosophy.com. You can also drop them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or any of the other online forums we frequent. All right, time for some feedback. Uh, this one comes from from user, this is a long bit of feedback, but I think it's good. It's something uh, that user underscore AK over on Reddit uh, brought up after we released the episode on uh, water chemistry focusing on minerals. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, and read everything that he wrote because I think it's good points. Malcolm, feel free to chime in on what you think about this stuff. Well, I have to chime in that every time you say minerals, I think of the, was it the lock, stock, and two smoking barrels, or is it snatch? <laughs> have you got the minerals? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, here, here, here's what uh, AK says. Uh, regarding the topic of water profiles of specific places to get close to the historic originals, I think it's a huge fallacy. First of all, we don't know where breweries got their water from. There may be quite the difference between well water closer to a river or further away from it, or they may be receiving it from the local works, which gets it from somewhere entirely different. Uh, he says, secondly, we don't know how brewers used to treat their water. Even before the industrialization of brewing, brewers had at least some understanding of soft versus hard water, uh, what difference it made to the different types of beer and how to purify water. For example, by boiling it uh, or filtering it through elaborated activated charcoal filters made from layers of sand and burnt animal bones. Third, the water supply of the general area where the brewery uh, the brewery's sides may have changed. Uh, in the specific case of Vienna Lager, for example, you'd assume Vienna water. The problem is with that style, uh, that style was first brewed in 1841. In the 1870s, water supply in Vienna fundamentally changed as the city started getting their water through a 95 kilometer long water pipeline from a natural spring in the Austrian Alps. But actually, Dreher's brewery was not located in Vienna, but in a suburb then called uh, Kleinschwechat. 
<laughs> you screwed that up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, were the suburbs attached to Vienna's fresh water supply? And if so, at what point in time did that happen? That's the kind of unknowns that make it very hard to say if or when a specific brewery or several breweries in one area used a particular water profile for brewing. Uh, I really love the point that he's making here, uh, particularly this idea of trying to match a a certain regional water profile. Well, also, like when you're trying to match style that you don't, it's like a, a shifting target or you're trying to lock a target in time and it may have shifted, as he explained. An- another good example of that is the uh, the Wicklow Mountain runoff for Guinness Brewery. You know, Martin Brungard essentially talked about how People assume they had really hard water, hence the very dark beer. Right. But the Wicklow runoff water and where they were tapping was actually quite soft water, you know, <laughs> as far as hardness goes. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So, uh, it's just that's that kind of fallacy abounds. In just it's not in beer uh, by itself, but essentially, you know, use the water that makes the beer taste good. Totally. And well, and I think I, I you know, I thankfully I think people are are understanding this concept that build the water profile that works for the beer that you're making and that matching a regional water profile yeah, may not be the best approach. I would say match it to, for a, a gross <coughs> pH. So we're talking like horseshoes here and hand grenades. Yeah, right. And right. then then adjust the minerals afterwards for flavor. So that's simplistic. Yeah. You know, it's that easy in my opinion. And it works. I mean, that's, I think that's what we're all doing. So, uh, good, co- good, good, good bit of feedback there. Uh, we got another one <laughs> from another user on Reddit with a very curious, uh, username. It's preparation H guzzler. Um, and he, <laughs> yeah, gross. Um, <laughs> Human I don't know much. where people come up with this stuff, dude. <laughs> um, but he, he had a comment on, uh, the carapilse episode that we did, which is in reference also to a, uh, experiment that we did comparing carapilse to no carapils. He says, uh, this is good stuff here. He says, I think it's important to try different extraction methods. If the contributing factor for head or body is protein, starch, or other, or other non-simple sugars, I would expect uh, one would only capitalize on those with higher extraction temperature, and I bet other extraction techniques contribute as well. If you do a low mash temperature, uh, the carapils will basically be a non-factor because it's designed to not affect flavor and color and probably has low levels of fermentables. I don't know. Uh, I think there's so much proteinaceous material and uh, beneficial bodybuilding dextrins that I just don't know how much it matters. I mean, it's definitely worth exploring and it's definitely worth ask, asking the question for sure. Yeah, but, I, ag- uh, I agree. I think, you know, um, m- my thinking about Carapils is that it's just marketed as the one-stop shop for better body, you know, for good mouthfeel and body and foam, uh, foam stand. And that doesn't seem to be what it's doing. In fact, you know, that we, as we discussed in that episode, there's research that shows that it's actually foam negative. Um, and so that, regardless of what the mash temperature is, if I have to work that hard to make this product work, it doesn't seem like it's really doing what it's supposed to be doing. I would say take it out and see if like the beer still. Yeah, you know, right. It's like everything else, you know, take one variable out, see if like the beer still. You know, if you're using good malt and, and good practices, and we'll talk about oxidation's effect on on head as well because that can actually degrade foam too yeah but uh essentially if good brewing practices you should have good foam yeah. i don't i don't see why you don't you know yeah i haven't you i mean toot my own horn i guess but i haven't used carapils in god probably a year and uh, I, I haven't used it in a year in one day yeah <laughs> yeah you beat me uh yeah. but but it, you know i'm not having any issues with it so um you know to each their own i guess hey i continue to get asked about the music that we use in this show quite a bit. I think I got like 16 emails last week alone. Um, if you like it, you can head over to brewlosophy.com slash music for links to hear more of Mark Gadgetar's stuff, as well as to download the song that we use in the outro. That's easily the one we get asked about the most. It's called Body High, and uh, it's by his group African Tiger. Again, that's brewlosophy.com slash music. Um, there's just links there to all of Mark's stuff over on SoundCloud. So uh, if you want to help us continue creating this content, you can head over to brewlosophy.com slash support, where you'll find a list of links to use when shopping for homebrew ingredients online. It's one of the easiest things you can do to support us without feeling a thing, and we really do appreciate it. It helps a ton. If you want a little something in return for your support, you can check out our Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month, you'll be granted access to never-before-published brewlosophy recipes, get access to a private brew crew forum, uh, you can get u- uh, unique discounts to Yakima Valley hops, and much more. In fact, one of our new rewards for 2018, which I think is really cool, is a monthly Q&A live 
live cast with someone special. Um, and I'm telling you, I've been reaching out to some folks uh, over the last couple of weeks, and I'm pretty sure homebrewers are going to be stoked to lob questions at these dudes. Uh, for January's live cast, I'm excited to announce that the author of American Sour Beers, the mad fermentationist himself, Michael Tonsmeyer, will be the guest. Uh, he's in the middle of starting a brewery, brewery with uh, Scott Janish. They're calling it Sapwood Cellars. My understanding is it's going to be focused on sour beers, barrel-aged beers. I'm sure they're going to have some New England style IPA in the mix as well. So on top of all of his knowledge about sour beer and that stuff, he can address questions regarding his experience going pro as well. Um, we've also scheduled Scott Janish to come on uh, and talk about uh, and to do the Q&A live cast uh, later on in the future as well. He's actually working on a book focused on IPA that's going to have a ton of stuff, a ton of research uh, regarding the New England IPA in it. Uh, that's the $5 a month level. You can check out it and all the other rewards we've offered over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the Brewlosophy podcast and leave a review wherever it is you listen to our podcasts. We're over 100 reviews uh, in the iTunes uh, Apple podcast. Um, they're all great and they do matter. So please do that. We really appreciate you for t- taking the time out of your day to leave us a review and to subscribe to the show. Okay, Malcolm, do you remember it was 2016, I believe, Homebrew Con in Baltimore where our mead making friend, Matt Crispin, uh, who's from Austin, Texas, uh, came up to us during the expo. We were just kind of walking around and he gave us a little sample of mead that he had made using ancho chilies. I do remember, and I personally enjoyed it, but yeah. I also like smoky peppers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit smoky. It was pretty hot. Um, I'm no mead expert, but uh, you know, I do love me some peppers, and I do remember that character being quite uh, pungent in the mead. Well, uh, Matt recently sent me a similar mead made using the slightly hotter habanero pepper. And uh, rather than keeping it all to myself, I very graciously shared it with my neighbors. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. It's like a nice clear one. Just tell me what you think. I don't even care anymore. What does it taste like? It's got a a piney. A piney? Oh, goodness. Oh, my God. You look like you're dying. Do not drink that. (laughs) Marco poured household cleaner in this cup. I think it's got some fireball dumped in it. Drink some more because I'm enjoying this. Uh. (laughs) Oh it's got an interesting smell. <laughs> it so does trash. God, I, I gotta, I can't smell anymore. No, be careful though, because this will probably be like one of his best friends. It doesn't matter. It, it's undrinkable. Can't wait for you to drink it. Okay, you ready? It's got like pepper burning my tongue. Are you gonna be all right? I've never seen a beer alter you in this. Let way. me wash it down with some Miller Lite. <laughs> you corporate mm. chill. <sighs> It smells. It's very jalapeno. Kind of fruity, pepper-ish. like the other fruity it's beers. No fruity. That we do. Ready for it? I'm gonna take a tug. Do it. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's horrible. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Now the burning is leaving. Now there's a there's a taste under the under the burning somewhere. We can get to it, but we have to journey there together, Timmy. Okay. Come on. Okay. We have to journey there together. I, I gave you some more input afterwards. Somewhere under the burning is a taste, and we will find it. Come on. I got nothing. It's too bad. The burning, you can't get past the burning. Yeah. I give it is zero. Is gasoline from your lawnmower? I give it zero Jersey Tim's. I, yeah, it's it's not for me. Like, if I want to drink in hot sauce, I'll do it. <laughs> but if there's a flavor waiting for me underneath there, I can't get there, man. <laughs> Dude, I can't get to the flavor. I get beat up by the jalapeno, and we tried. We tried to get to the flavor. We did. It kind of smells like leather. I just can't. I can't get past the punch in the face. Yeah, that's the problem, man. I, like I want to enjoy drinking beer. Like I don't want to have to be like a full on assault. I just want to enjoy a beer. Oh man, I I wasn't quite sure what their response was going to be. Uh, and I was in the back. I, you can probably hear me at different points. I was laughing my butt off uh, when they were drinking this beer, or it wasn't a beer. This meat. Uh, and uh, what a good time that one was. Uh, the, the, the mead, in my opinion, um, was very mead e. I'm not a big mead fan. Uh, and so it tasted like, you know, a honey wine that had a lot of habaneros in it. And it was so hot. Like, uh, you know, the, the heat kind of came on slowly. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what Matt did to create this mead. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful drink. It was crystal clear. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really thankful to Matt uh, for sending that in uh, so I could serve it to my buddies. He was actually on, um, we were, we were Facebook live streaming that, uh, 
one minute beer and he was on and, and he's la- a good sport for doing that man oh he's a good sport i mean the guys yeah. you know ribbed him they didn't know what it was it's funny that jersey you know called out that it's probably one of marshall's friends and yeah you know, um, and it that's was one, and that's one of the parts i tuned in on right there i was like <laughs> it's probably one of his friends it's probably this is supposed to be probably really good yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh, we've got a lot of fun uh reviews coming up so uh if you like it great if not skip through it Uh, all right we've got to give some love to the folks who make the show possible when we come back from this brief message uh, we're going to be getting into everything about oxidation on the cold side the best beer requires the best hops which yakima valley hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world find everything from classics to modern favorites as well as cool experimental varieties and a vast array of ingredients and gear at yakimavalleyhops.com Shopping for brewing supplies online can be a real hassle, which is why we recommend Love to Brew. They've got great prices, super fast shipping, and they carry exclusive products like East Coast Yeast, the Brewers Essentials brand, and their award-winning beer recipe kits. They're also the only place you can pick up your very own Brewlosophy recipe kit. The numbers don't lie. Love to Brew has hundreds of five-star reviews and thousands of brewers are choosing them for their supplies and ingredients each year. Experience the difference at lovetobrew.com. That's love, the number two, brew.com After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste time chilling work, which is why I use cleverly designed immersion chillers from Jaded Brewing. After some bad experiences with counterflow and plate chillers, I began the search for a more efficient chilling solution and discovered Jaded. That was nearly four years ago, and to this day, I continue to rely on the King Cobra and the Hydra to chill my wort in record time without the setup or cleaning hassle of other chillers. If you're looking for a way to optimize your brew day, I can't recommend Jaded Chillers enough. Go see what they have to offer at jadedbrewing.com and let them know brewlosophy sent you founded in 1978 by brewing pioneer charlie papazian the american home brewers association is a division of the brewers association focused specifically on protecting and promoting the hobby of home brewing in addition to their work lobbying for the rights of home brewers across the country they're also the primary sponsor of brewlosophy.com by joining the aha not only are you supporting their cause but you get a ton of benefits as well discounts at brewers across the u.s early access to tickets for events like the great american beer festival and you get to attend homebrewcon the world's biggest gathering of home brewers head over to brewlosophy.com slash AHA now to sign up to become a member. Oxidation is an issue uh, that's been the bane of many a brewer's existence, primarily for its impact on shelf stability, which um, there are various ways that it can impact shelf stability. What exactly is oxidation? How does it happen? Okay, so quick chemistry, and I promise the bore. Uh, you or myself too much, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, oxidation can be you know, simplified as a chemical reaction in which you have an exchange of electrons. It's not always the case, right? There's exceptions to that rule, but in a general sense, we could say oxidizing is the removal of electrons. And then when that those electrons go over to another compound, that is called reducing. So the gaining of electron is... Uh, it's reducing and oxidizing is the giving of electrons, thus changing the molecule. And those are basically called redox reactions. Okay. So in general, it's, it's called like a free radical process and the, and the transition metals can be a catalyst. So something like iron and, and copper inside solution can help catalyze these reactions. And then all the things in a beer that get oxidized, we can generally call them ROSs, not R-O-U-S's, like in uh, Princess Bride, uh, <laughs> rodents of unusual size. <laughs> Instead, these are reactive oxygen species. So these are the things that tend to react. And oxygen tends to be uh, one of, if not the most, taking of electron uh, electrons. So it's it's very it's a taker. You know, it, it's a very reactive and apt to take electrons from carbon-based uh, molecules. Right. Uh, of which there them. are many in beer. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So on a, on a, to, to kind of like put this into more practical terms, um, this, this thing that keeps us alive, oxygen, <clears throat> is responsible for also being, uh, on many, I think, fronts, the, the culprit of 
beer, not spoilage so much as it is beer staling and, and various other uh, negative things that we don't necessarily want in our beer. Yeah, it's, it's, it ends up being the changing of things. So that change can be good if you want it. For example, an old ale or a Baltic porter, you know, some of that character is desired. But it can also be negative, like if you want a fresh, bready Pilsner or a, a hoppy uh, IPA. You know, what happens is these compounds go through this series of changes and it, uh, it perpetuates. So you end up going from these carbonyl end products down to aldehydes, which are very flavor uh, intense, and then even down to ketones, which are, can be like carboxylic acids and such. Right. So these aldehydes are things like, you know, acetaldehyde or uh, uh, benzene aldehyde, which is almonds, right? So benzene aldehyde or benzaldehyde, I should say, you wouldn't want that in a Pilsner, right? Do you want your Pilsner to taste like almonds, you know, or, or an, an IPA to taste like almonds? Right, uh, I right. say no. No, no, definitely but, not. Yeah. Yeah. But in a Creek, that, that's part of the signature character, you know? So some of that oxidative character in a Creek is not only welcomed, you know, it's considered beneficial. Right, right. Or desirable at the very least. Yeah. And so absolutely. we, so it, when it comes to oxidation, there, there are various vectors, um, where it can happen. I think recently there's been, there's been kind of an uptick and talk about oxidation on the uh, kind of, kind of hot side. And even prior to that, I mean, there, you know, you've got a, a group of folks who are really focusing right now and doing a lot of work uh, and research on oxidation that occurs from the point of milling the grain even. Um, but what we're focusing on in this episode is specifically the oxidation that occurs um, you know, post fermentation. So after the beer has already been fermented, um, and and in that respect, there are again, there's there's quite a few vectors of where oxidation can occur. Um, all of them uh, basically leading to the same thing that we've talked about: uh, th- these issues, at least purported issues, um, negative that negatively impact the beer. Things like the flavor and aroma. And I know in my experience, what I You know, at first, like I said earlier, you know, my conception of an oxidized beer was that it tasted like wet cardboard. I've never tasted wet cardboard, but that's what I read in a book. Well, we're trained on that, right? Exactly. We're told that, and you know, some people will even say it's overemphasized, and it does, and to my opinion, detriment to us as beer appreciators because you become too narrowly focused on this one thing. It's like, oh, it's not cardboard, wet cardboard. So it's not oxidized, and right. that's just not the case. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and what I've come, what I've come to experience is oxidized, and I can again, you know, th- this is without like lab testing to prove that the beer is oxidized, uh, but but for me, it's like this. For most of the beers that I that I brew, that that um, I that I think you know have this oxidation character, it's kind of like a, a sickly sweet. Um, the the beer starts to take on a darker color. Uh, it, there, and it's just it's never it's never something that I enjoy. We'll put it that way. Um, well, yeah, dullness is another one. So stripping of flavor. So and we talked about how you basically have a changing of compounds. You know, from these you know maybe these grain characters into undesirable al- aldehydes and ketones. Well, you're literally altering you know, the beer. You yeah. Know? So so some of that can be a swapping of intensities. So you have a lowering of desirable compounds and an increase of undesirable compounds. So that sweetness might literally be the removal of nice bready, you know, melanoidins. And then they're shifted over into like a two, three pentane dione sweetness, which is like a honey. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and then when you have that, you just, you stomp all over the fresh grainy character and you're left with the sweet, Unnuanced, unlayered character, and and you know? I mean, I, I think I've experienced that where 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 I experience the detrimental aspect of oxidation the most is in hoppy beers, and you know, there's a there's a lot of talk about you know, drink your IPA, drink your double IPA fresh. Um, that's when it's going to be best. I agree with that. And for me, the, the, the reduction in hop character is even more noticeable than any change that I might perceive in the malt character of the beer. Uh, I mean, I've had uh, just for, you know, I guess for, I'm a weirdo. So for fun, you know, I've left hop hoppy beers in my keyser for two or three months just to see how they would taste after a while. And I definitely, at least, uh, you know, what I think I'm picking up on this kind of swapping of, hop character for a stronger, sweeter malt character that, that does have that sweet honey thing going on. Like you mentioned, a neat experiment at home is you can take a a beer that you enjoy and you you sacrifice a soldier, right? You take one, you you have your capper and and another cap, 
uh, available to you because most home brewers have cappers and caps and you pop a, preferably a hoppy beer because it's like you said very noticeable pop the beer kind of move it around a little bit to get that co2 layer to churn a little bit you can even blow into it for a second then recap it and then put them aside for like uh two or three weeks go back and taste those two beers and, and even look at them too yeah yeah i mean the expectation would be that there would be a pretty drastic difference between the two i'll be honest when i when i started home brewing oxidation wasn't something I really thought about too much. I remember, you know, the the dude who sold me my kit at the homebrew shop just telling me, D try not to splash your beer around when you're uh, racking to your bottling bucket, you know? And and when I got into kegging, I, I did the whole like open lid, you know, very gently fill from the bottom up under this assumption that it would push the oxygen out and fill that space with CO2. And, you know, like I had pretty good success. I was winning awards. My beers tasted good to me and my friends. Um, but there are definitely definitely various uh, ways that, that you can oxidize your beer, again, um, various sources of that oxygen ingress um, that I think we should cover here real quick. Things, again, I think a lot of people, um, for, for whatever reason, kind of poo-poo a little bit. Um, the first one that I could come up with is is when <laughs> the, the when you t remove the lid or whatever it is you do so that you can check your final gravity. Um, that that when you do that, just the removal of a lid or the or when you take off a carboy cap or a bung, that is going to stir up the gas that's that is layering your beer enough to bring some oxygen in. It, it, you know that's the way gases work. Yeah. So so the funny thing is, here is some people say you know you're. You're worrying too much, and they want to do the relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. And that's great. Because like you said, you can do a lot of these sins and be fine. Totally. But it's the cumulative effect, right? So yes, the science says, and, and the laws of gas will say, you take that bung off, okay, you have this, you know, people think it's a magical blanket of CO2. And by and large, it is a blanket of CO2 because it's a heavier gas. Right. But, you know, a little pop of that cork there. <laughs> It's gonna, you're going to churn, and you're going to get a couple of PPM, uh, definitely PPB, maybe PPM of uh, of oxygen in there. Yeah. And that's going to react with that beer. That is going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Now, does it manifest itself to the point where you can perceive it? That's the question. That's the question. So how many times can you do these little sins? You know, once you start lining them up, they're almost like tumblers on a lock, right? Right. You can probably get away with one here, one here, one here. Right. And, and in the end... At some point, it's going to show its face. Right. So, you know? so it, let, let's just to go through these different uh, vectors of of uh, ingress, oxygen ingress. Uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll kind of talk about the the ones we came up with, and then some solutions. Obviously, the one for uh, lid removal to take samples is just don't take samples. Um, that leaves you without really knowing what your final gravity is, I suppose. Uh, which, if you trust your fermentation process, probably isn't a big deal. You can take a final gravity sample after you've packaged. Uh, but that's one thing. Uh, another option would be to <laughs> This seems really convoluted, but or, or complicated. But you run CO two into the headspace of your fermenter while you're taking the sample. Um, again, you're going to still be mixing air in there, and it, this is an idea that someone proposed a while back to me that I've never tried. But I suppose it's better than nothing. Um, yeah, yeah. So you definitely are injecting air, you know, because depending on the concentration of your CO two, there's air in there. Uh, if you have ninety, you know, nine point nine five percent air or uh, pardon me, CO2, as far as purity. The rest of that, you have to assume is air. It's not always the case, but we assume it's air. Right. And one-fifth of that is oxygen. So you're putting oxygen into that into that space. <laughs> now, I mean, I mean, come on. You're like, okay, come on. But, so you are putting oxygen into that space. Yeah, it's But is happen. it better, is, is it the lesser of evils than just opening it up? Because you, you basically, you're, you have a positive pressure and you're displacing our... our lowering the ability of oxygen to come in through that positive pressure in your fermentation vessel. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, is it, is it better than doing it without CO2, potentially? Uh, is it going to stop or completely eliminate the risk of oxidation caused by taking samples out of your beer? I don't think so, but it might. You know, if you want to do it and you have a lot to spend on CO2, go for it. Um, another, another way oxygen, and this one has been one I've been thinking a lot about lately. Uh, another way that oxygen can make it into your post fermented beer is, uh, suck back during cold crashing. You know, cold crashing is this process whereby, uh, you reduce the temperature of the beer or the chamber that your beer is in, uh, and bring it down to, I, I go down to 30 degrees, 32 degrees, uh, so that it drops out the particulate in that beer so that you're kegging clearer beer. It's also the point at which I add, uh, gelatin and whatnot, which is another vector for 
oxidation, uh, some would argue. Um, and so it's going to happen when you, as you cool stuff, it creates a vacuum in your ferment in your fermenter that's going to suck uh, oxygen or the the existent air in your chamber into the fermenter, and that's going to impact the beer. That's going to at least touch the beer. Right. Absolutely. And that's once again that o- oxygen is highly reactive, and it's going to change. Yeah. So, so. At this point, you'd say, what are our methods of, of changing this? So I was experimenting for a while by making a almost like a cask breather. So I had basically like a half pound of CO2 connected to a blow-off tube when I started doing my cooling. So when the pressure did lower inside the fermentation vessel, it pulled a diaphragm and instead injected CO2. That was, you know, a bit beyond the norm you know, but that tends to be the way I used to do things. Yeah. Um, but there's other methods too. Uh, why don't you talk about that NorCal method? Yeah, yeah. So NorCal Brewing Solutions, uh, that's their website's NorCalBrewingSolutions.com. Um, and they they invented this really neat, very clever CO2 capture device that, you know, it's like two ball jars with a, um, you. they have a replacement lid that has a couple of uh, stainless uh, kind of tubes welded into it. Um, basically, what it does is it is it you it captures the CO2 that uh, that is created during fermentation, um, pushes an amount of water that's in the ball jar or the mason jar um, out of one vessel. So the CO2 is pushing that uh, water out and uh, going into a second uh, mason jar, and that way, you know, ostensibly you've got one jar that's just full of CO2. So that uh, the you have a tube connecting rather than an airlock. Basically, you have a tube that connects from your fermenter and that goes down and collects that CO2 that is created during fermentation. The idea being that during cold crash, that vacuum sucks the CO2 from the jar back into the fermenter. It's a really cool device. I've used it twice already, and in both times, it seemed to work fine. I mean, it it looked like it was working. You know, the, the vacuum definitely did suck some water from one jar back into the other, but that never touches the beer. Um, it doesn't, there's a, these, these are large enough jars uh, so that you don't get any of that suck back. And again, I can only assume, but it would seem like the the um, CO2 is being sucked back into the fermenter as opposed to the environmental oxygen uh, that's in my chamber. Pretty neat, pretty neat device. Yeah, I made a, a kind of ghetto fabulous version of this uh, <laughs> sometime back based off of a thumper from a still. Oh, right. Yeah, and it was, it was the same concept. Uh, I don't think it was as well engineered. You know, it was kind of like garage engineered, right? Uh, w- with some tubing and and some uh, slip fittings and some compression fittings on. Uh, I think they were one one liter uh, mason jars. So it, it was, you know, I didn't really back then. I wasn't doing blind triangles and stuff like that. But you know, I think I convinced myself it was working. Sure, yeah. <laughs> we would never do that. I mean, God, us humans. <laughs> uh, there are definitely other more like rudimentary uh, solutions to this. Uh, suck back during cold crashing issue. One of them is just a not cold crash. Um, you can package your beer warm. Uh, that relies, uh, you would have to rely on, you know, for hoppy or dry hopped beers or whatever, uh, you'd have to rely on probably filtering out your hops. So using a bag or some sort of a of a hop filter uh, for that. Uh, you're going to end up racking more yeast over to uh, your, what are the, whether it's your bottling bucket or your keg, um, because cold crashing will knock some of that yeast out of solution. Uh, but it definitely works. I've done that a few times just to experiment with it. So what I like to do is uh, basically I'll finish my beer in a keg. So you're, you're more or less like keg spunding. And I started doing it out of laziness, to tell you the truth, because it was like, oh, I'm I'm pretty much uh, just wanting to get this done. And I used to have a weird schedule in my previous job. And, and what I would do is I would wait until I had about a half Play-Doh left of fermentation. And then I would put it in the keg and let it finish. Right. And... So that scavenged oxygen, you, you know, theoretically, you have more yeast activity, and I just cut my, I cut my keg uh, tubes about an inch or two higher, and, and basically, yeah, you sacrifice a couple of pints, like you said, but you were going to sacrifice those pints anyways when you racked off a troop. Right. Right. Yeah. And then they came up with this uh, clear draw system, this clear beer. It's like a float. It almost acts like a cast widget. And then I started using that game changer. You know, you're pretty much spunding your beer and then you're drawing from the top so you don't have to wait as long for it to settle 
it, it's an amazing thing. The uh, the know? clear draw is I don't use them. Um, I, I I get clear beer using my methods as it is, so I don't have an issue with it. But it is a very clever. Uh, it's basically a, like a like a, a vinyl tube or whatever type type of tube that connects to this. Um, a widget type of thing that sits atop the beer in the keg and draws from the top of the beer in the keg. So you can have as much junk at the bottom of the keg as you want. You're going to draw that clear uh, beer from the top of the keg as opposed to from the bottom as happens usually with kegging. Yeah, it works just like a cast widget. It has a a float that looks like uh, if you open up the back of a toilet, like the flushing mechanism, (laughs) it it looks like a metal version of that. So Uh. it's a float that's pulling from just below the surface of the keg yeah that's cool and then it, it follows the level down so a cast widget works you know in a similar way yeah and I, I just like it because if you have a little bit of agitation on a keg or whatever and it, we've talked about uh beer and sweat before where you bring kegs you know all the way across ohio yeah so i'll put those clear beers in, in a few of those kegs that i know have some sediment in them that because i finished in this manner and i don't have to worry about having uh unclear beer. Yeah, that's rad. That's rad. Um, another solution would be to crash under pressure. You see a lot of people doing this these days. Um, and that just means uh, figuring out a way to put gas on the fermenter while you're cold crashing. You have to have a fermenter that can accept, that can hold pressure. I mean, that's the key to that one. Um, I've done this. I've, I've kind of rigged up a, <laughs> it's kind of this wonky looking setup uh, that I can push some gas into my SS Brutech brew buckets. They're not rated for pressure, so it's not safe. I wouldn't recommend people do it. And I did uh, lose some CO2 because it was the entire time I was cold crashing, I was pushing one PSI onto um, the beer and the I could hear it kind of leaking out of the sides of the lid um, on the brew bucket. It worked. I feel like it worked. But, uh, you know, I did lose some CO2 and you don't want to go too high. Um, but there are fermenters out there that are uh, rated for for to hold pressure like that. So that's similar to my cask breather method, in which I was doing a diaphragm version of that. So you're just basically letting leak by be your pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. Pressure exactly. Leak. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it works. Like I said, uh, finally, I think, I think a really cool solution to this and one that uh, our contributor, Matt Del Fiaco, I think does primarily. And I know that uh, Jake has messed around with as well is just to ferment in a keg. Um, when you ferment in a keg, usually what people are doing is a blow off tube uh, connected to a disconnect to the gas disconnect. Um, and then once fermentation is done, you can just plop that off and either, uh, you know, basically spund. So you can, you can, uh, car- naturally carbonate by just taking that off and letting it carbonate that way. Uh, but you can cold crash with it off as well. And it's not going to suck anything back in. You've got a keg full of beer and CO2. Uh, and, uh, so you can, that's a good way to avoid oxidation during cold crashing. Right on. All right. The, uh, let's see the, the, uh, the other way I could think about, um, oxidation is exposure to oxygen during the packaging process. Um, this is what we talked about a little bit earlier. Just don't splash when you're racking to the bottling bucket. You can purge your, your bottling bucket with CO2 if you want. Again, I'm, I think what you're going to end up doing for the most part is just mixing up some CO2 with the oxygen that's in your bottling bucket, but it might be better than nothing. Um, there's definitely options for closed transfer kegging. Um, and the way I do it is I don't generally purge my kegs with CO2, uh, but I do rack my beer into kegs that have the lid closed on it. So I've got a piece of tubing connected to the a liquid disconnect uh, for my pin lock kegs. You can do it with ball lock as well. And then I run the beer from my uh, fermenters into the liquid post of my keg and fill very gently from the bottom up. Um, you have to have some sort of a depressor mechanism for your uh, for the gas post, and it works really well. Um, I still sort of have this belief that by doing that, you are pushing most of the oxygen out, and that uh, at, at the very most, the, the top of the beer is the only thing that really is exposed to any amount of oxygen, and you know, probably fallaciously, but I sort of believe that it's prob- it's not having a huge impact. Well, I think once again, it's like a lesser of two evils. So is it oxygen free transfer? No. But maybe you're mitigating oxygen damage, right? You know, right. So um, you can almost think of the ability to oxidize a beer almost like the buffering capacity of water. You know, so you know, buffering is the resistance of change of pH when an acid is added. Well, beer is similar. In fact, there's even tests for this. What they can do is they can see how much oxygen a beer can take before we start to recognize off flavors. And this is done both by a spectrometer. So they, they create a curve and then they compare it to their sensory panels. Right. 
And it's really wild because they create this curve and they basically, this curve represents like the ability of the beer to withstand oxidation. Right. So they know you have X amount of sins down the line, right? Yeah, yeah. But what's also interesting to me is they still compare it to taste, Yeah. right? So ultimately it's a human. So <laughs> these humans go, at this point, we can tell, you know? Yeah. And they overlap that to a curve. Well, that's what's happening from the end, because we're talking about uh, the cold side here. You know, if you have a little bit during uh, transfer from your, uh, wait, after you chill, so you have a little bit of oxidation between chill and pitch. Presumably, now your beer is almost at zero ppm uh, oxygen, right? Right. Now we're going to transfer. Or, 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 no, even before that. So we pitch, we ferment. Now we do cold crash. Well, we're going to pick up a little oxygen in there, right? That's a little bit of that oxygen buffering capacity, you know? So we're closer to being able to tell. Right. And, and now we transfer. Now we're closer to being able to tell. Yeah. All the while, we're closer to being able to tell and we're reducing shelf life. Right. So the time uh, until we can tell. Yeah. And so there, there are some other ways uh, th- for packaging sake um, to reduce exposure to oxygen. Um, and I think probably the most popular one is to purge, uh, you know, the, the, this idea of purging the keg with CO2 before you fill it with beer. Um, the, the method that I think a lot of people are using nowadays is to fill a keg with sanitizer. So you're sanitizing at the same time and then push that sanitizer out with CO2, um, and which is going to basically leave you with a keg full of gas. Uh, I've done this before. Again, it does seem to work really well. Um, there are some people out there who I know will fill an empty keg with gas and they just purge it a million times. Uh, that's definitely one option. I'm not sure it works very well. Uh, I, I, again, I, I've never done this cause it feels like a huge waste of gas for the most part. Um, and then finally for, at least when it comes to kegging, um, one option is to, uh, do basically what I did, what I, the way I keg, which is to not purge the keg, but fill from the bottom up. And then when you put it in your keys or you purge that headspace, um, I know Ray, our contributor Ray found does, uh, like 16 purges <laughs> with, with a CO2 to, um, you know, under uh, understanding that, that, that gas is going to mix in there with, so you're going to have CO2 and O2. And he figures the more I do that, the less, O2, the less O2 is going to be in that headspace. So those are some ways to, to, uh, reduce your oxygen exposure during packaging. And then finally, the, the last bit I want to hit on, uh, before we head to break is, uh, how to reduce oxygen while bottling from kegs, something that anyone who ever enters a competition, who's a, who kegs their beer, uh, has to be concerned with. Right. And, you know, for mitigating oxygen there, you can you know, flush with CO2 before you fill. Uh, you can do the bottom up fill method. You've seen those. Uh, are they, what do they call those things like the the poor man's bottling wand or whatever? We call it the brew and, bottler. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. But there, there's ones on, you know, like a homebrew talk forms and stuff like that, um, which you basically do a quiescent type fill from the bottom. Right. And then you can also, of course, bottle condition. Right. Because the yeast is going to scavenge, uh, you know, oxygen and it's also going to you know, potentially reduce some of those aldehydes and, and right. transfer them back. Right. You're not going to bottle condition beer that's been in a keg, of course, but bottle conditioning does, um, you know, reduce the, I guess, the likelihood for oxidation. I think the most popular device out there uh, for bottling from kegs is the is the Blickman beer gun, which has a like a, a nozzle so that you can actually burst CO2 into the bottle before you fill it. Um, so it's kind of the same concept as bo- as as, as uh, kegging, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you essentially, uh, you know, evacuate that space, which is similar to what people in the industry do. They do a, uh, a flush with CO2 and then evac it with a vacuum. They do it like two or three times, you know, and th- then they fill from the bottom uh, slowly so you don't have a, a sloshing of beer. Yeah, right. Um, we've done some experiments on all of this stuff uh, on uh, basically focused on the oxidation that it c- can occur uh, once fermentation is complete. Uh, we got to take a quick break. But when we get back, we're going to dig into that. Stick with us. When dumping wort-soaked grain in leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and cleanup is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Come. 
compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to Grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to Grainfather.com, that's Grainfather.com, and get started today. All right. So uh, when it comes to oxidation, we were, you know, I think all of us have our beliefs, you know, about about the impact it has. And I think I might have mentioned it earlier that in the beginning, I didn't want to believe that it would have much of an impact, um, you know, because I don't want to have to go through the trouble of reducing oxygen at all these different steps. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, but we we did a series of experiments looking at post fermentation oxidation. Uh, one of which was actually um, one that you did, Malcolm, involving uh, oxidation when racking from a uh, when bottling from the keg. Yeah. So the idea was to kind of replicate what might happen at a competition, right? And yeah, we probably could have done things to to make it quote worse. But basically, I wanted to bottle how I thought people bottled and how I bottled, and then set it in a warm space for a couple weeks because that happens at a lot of competitions. People don't realize it, but it sits there in someone's garage, in someone's house, at a homebrew store. You know, not all these things get refrigerated. That right? explains why I haven't won NHC. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, uh, mentioned previous segment, uh, the Blickman beer gun, which I have, I love, I think it's great. Uh, I use that to fill a couple bottles and I, I think I even went overboard with the flushing to, you know, give it every possibility. Cause I, I do this when I bottle for competition, I, I flushed it for, I think, I think it was 45 seconds. I said in the experiment, so I'm sitting here, you know, counting to 45 or using my watch or whatever. And then I filled it, you know, nice and slow. And of course the beer's cold. I had my bottles cold. I tried to do everything, you know, quote, best practices. And I filled up like three different bottles. And then doing the complete opposite of that, I just used a Cobra tap and just filled it right in the bottle. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is I know a couple brewers who do that. So I was know? just going to say, man, I, I know some I know some of the best brewers who win awards all the time who that's how they package for. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It hurts my heart. <laughs> you know? I'm just like, why are you doing that? Uh, and I've seen some of these bottle shops are, uh, uh, you know, beer tap rooms and stuff like that. And they don't do much better than that when they're filling a growler. Oh, no. You know? Yeah. So anyways, uh, I did that. So I just basically splashed it into this freaking uh, a bottle. You know, I did have the pressure low and the bottles were cold. So it didn't make like a complete mess, you know, but it, it was pretty foamy and it was, it was pretty raucous. Now, I also did a third series in which I used a stopper on a racking cane, like kind of cut off. And I've seen that a lot. Like, yeah, that's a com that's a common approach these days. Yeah, and I do that when I go to parties and such. I because I, I have it right next to my my kegerator. I just pop it into the the Cobra tap. It fits in by a snug fit. Uh, use the stopper. I kind of fill until it kind of starts pushing back, and then I use my finger to loosen it up. Yeah, and so I did all three methods, and then we served them. And, so uh, then uh, what you did was you served this to 41 people. Now, there were a couple of things we were, we were looking at with uh, this experiment. First off, it was the does the uh, does the does the shoddy packaging approach make a perceptible difference compared to using, you know, the, the beer gun to, to purge the bottle of its oxygen uh, and whatnot. So we were looking at that first off. So the perceptible kind of sensory science stuff. Uh, but then but then and we'll get into this after we, we go over the data. We were also curious about measured levels of O2. So we'll get into that. You served these beers. Um, the two that you compared were, it was the, the no oxygen at packaging compared to the shoddy one, right? Yeah, I went for uh, best and worst. So I, I didn't use the cane version in the middle. 
So you got um, uh, you got 41 people to take the triangle test of these two beers. Um, and of those 41, 19 were expected to get would, would have been expected to get it right uh, to pick the odd beer out in order to say that the the beers were, you know, uh, reliably distinguishable or significantly different. Um, and in the end, only 15, uh, 15 of these people, which is just shy of about one third, uh, were able to detect the difference, which we could say that that they were able to guess, uh, properly guess the right one, uh, because that's not significant. Yeah. Uh, and that was astonishing to me, you know, cause I think, I think it was two or three weeks in my laundry room, which fluctuates temperatures pretty good. Cause you know, my dryer's in there, even though it's vented, but it gets warmer in there. Uh, so I, I was astonished cause this was, this was a delicately flavored beer. This was a, uh, a cream ale. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, you weren't the only astonished one. I know that that our readers, um, all of us contributors, were pretty convinced that these were going to be different. And uh, what was your experience like tasting these beers? Well, one, I was shocked that there wasn't more color pickup. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and you know, for the record, like a lot of these experiments, I just want to do this one again so bad. But you know, the data is the data. You know, and for whatever reason, it, it didn't pick up color. And while I detected it, I think two out of three. For, for my blinds, for my blind trials, to me, the the one that was, quote, ostensibly more oxidized via the uh, picnic tap method, it, it, it was more Venice. It, it had like a, this Venice and almost medicinal character to me. Huh. Was it like, it, but for you, was it crazy different? Um, obviously, it wasn't enough for the majority of people uh, to tell it apart uh, when they didn't know what they were drinking. Um, well, I myself got it wrong one out of three. Yeah. So yeah. I, mean, I was, you know, so I can't. You know, I, I just can't sit here and say, oh, absolutely, it was different because I, I got it wrong once. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Know? But uh, yeah, I thought it was, you know, and I, I did find myself, you know, going back to it and thinking like, this should be more stark. This should be more stark. Why is it not <laughs> oh, so crazily different? How often know? I experienced that? Well, I did an experiment um, testing a similar thing, except without bottling. Well, what I did is I brewed uh, two batches of the same beer. In fact, it was the same batch, a 10 gallon batch, and then uh, fermented them exactly the same. Everything about these beers was the same. Uh, and then during packaging, oh, this is going to hurt your heart, dude. Uh, during packaging, mm. uh, I did I kegged one using my normal method. I did not purge the keg, but I did do a closed transfer uh, packaging for, the, for, for one batch. Uh, uh, and then for the other one, I actually left, I cut off a small piece of tubing, connected it to the, uh, to the valve on my fermenter, and then just dangled that into the keg and let it splash down into the keg. I mean, we're talking a good, you know, two foot, two and a half foot drop. Foam was coming up everywhere. It was a mess. If you want to see it, you can head over to brewlosophy.com and search for post-fermentation oxidation. Uh, it's the first experiment that I did on this one. Um, so then when those were done, I let those sit in the in my keyser for, I think, about a month. Um, you know, I wanted to give it time for any bad stuff to happen. Um, so after about a month in the keyser, I served... 24 participants a triangle test which uh, would require 13 to get it right in order for us to say that it was significant and in the end only 11 people were able to identify the unique sample um, I'll tell you this so I, I you know when people are done taking the test I usually have I chat with them about it what were their impressions this was one where most people were like you know th those those beers were the same I don't know if I was right or if I was wrong there was very little confidence we'll say um, I totally convinced that I was going to be able to get these beers right and get the triangle test right. I gave myself 10 blind triangle temps, uh, triangle tests. And uh, of those attempts, I was only correct three times. So less than one third, despite completely knowing um, about what the variable was. Uh, yeah. Again, I was completely shocked with these that the, and, and if you look at the pictures in the experiment article, the beers looked exactly the same, same experience as you, Malcolm. They, they, they weren't the, the oxidized one was no darker than the other one, which left me kind of wondering. Somebody called us out um, on, I believe it was one of the Facebook or, or Reddit, um, for saying that. Well, it could be. It's, it could be that neither. It, you know, I, I kind of went with the idea that maybe neither of them are oxidized. Neither of them tasted oxidized to me. Um, but somebody else pointed out uh, that it could be that both were equally oxidized. Yeah, um, that's, that's and, where I was going. Yeah, you know, and, and, and that we're and, closing the door after the after the cows are gone. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. And so that could be it. And it could just be that everybody is drinking oxidized beer all the time and that we like it, you know. Um, so that's always a possibility. And then a few people commented that we just didn't let the beer age long enough. And that's why we didn't taste a difference. So 
I had about two gallons of each of these batches left, uh, so I took the kegs out of my keezer, um, and I threw them into our guest bathroom, which you know maintains 68 to 72 degrees, and I left them for two and a half months. So this, so so two and a half months in the keezer, or uh, sorry, a one month in the keezer, two and a half months warm again, um, and you know people are claim that 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 warmth uh, will encourage the oxidation effect. That's typically true for most things. Um, so the beers were over 100 days old when I started collecting data again on the same beers. And I, I, I remember the anticipation I had to see if these beers would look different. Um, and when I poured them side by side, not only did they not look different, but compared to the pictures uh, from two and a half months earlier, they, they didn't look any different uh, from you know those earlier samples either. Um, I served these beers to 20 participants until the kegs kicked, um, which would require 11 to get it right in order to say it was significant, and only nine got it right. Not a single person noted oxidation off flavors. The beer was generally re- well received, and in my opinion, um, I, first off, I was unable to tell them apart, but the beers tasted how I remember them tasting from two and a half months uh, earlier. So they were there was no cardboard or that hard, sweet, hard candy flavors. Uh, it, it seems weird to me that I tried so hard to mess this beer up, and I wasn't really able to do so yeah that's it really does fly in the face of everything i i uh think i know so it it really does question a lot of things but you know i i know we've talked about testing rigor and stuff like that before so you know there's something else going on which is fine yeah you know I mean, ox, ox, oxidation happens. I think that's the point that I want to get out there is we know for a fact it can be measured. It is happening. Your beer is affected by oxidation. The question is, you know, to what extent is that perceptible? Um, I do think that there are certain styles for whatever reason. Uh, New England IPA seems to be one of them that are way more sensitive to oxygen at certain points uh, than other styles. Um, I've, I've personally witnessed and, you know, th- this, this discoloration uh, when, uh, you know, we, we did a, a, an experiment that we're going to talk about in another show on New England IPA and the effect oxi- oxygen has on it. And it did seem to produce um, a more observable difference. So uh, things to definitely be wary of. I think it's not a bad idea to try to keep oxygen on the cold side uh, low. You know, that's my advice is, is I still try to keep it low. Uh, I may not go to crazy extent to do that, but but um, it's not something that I want to intentionally introduce. Yeah, I, I take some I take some crazy measures sometimes. So for competition beers, uh, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, a, a culmination of, of better or best practices or safe practices, if you want to word it that way. Yeah. Uh, to basically reduce the sin to the beer and it, its cumulative effects over time. And it gives me the best potential for a good showing. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're never in trouble being cautious. You know what I mean? Like it, when it comes yeah. to packaging beer, when it comes to taking care of your beer or whatever, you're never, you're never going to make things worse by just being cautious. Um, uh, unless it really detracts from your enjoyment. If, if, if being so cautious removes the enjoyment from you uh, of the hobby, then screw it. Make yeah. what you like. Yeah. You yeah, know? totally. Well, and if being overly cautious becomes your dogmatic, you know, I'm going to scream it from the rooftops thing so that you negatively impact other people's enjoyment. That's something one ought to consider as well. Maybe I don't know. Sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, so I think we've covered, um, you know, most about uh, a lot about the, the cold side oxidation. We have definitely done experiments on hot side aeration, and we've looked into the low oxygen brewing technique. You can find all of that stuff over at brewlosophy.com uh, slash experiments. You can actually search the table that we have there of, uh, of the experiments that we've performed. Check it out there. Um, Malcolm, anything else on oxidation? I did get support from a local brewery to run these beers through an orbisphere. The numbers are published in the article under uh, flushing with CO2. So uh, on average, the beer gun was was much, much lower. In fact, I would say it was on the magnitude of 10 times lower. So beer gun, twenty five, uh, 26.5 ppb of oxygen and up to 43 ppb oxygen for uh, non-shaken versus shaken samples. And the picnic tap averaged from 250 to 700 ppb uh, non-shaken to shaken. And um, I, I did several iterations of, of the, that's why I said average. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, the picnic tap was... 45 to 117 ppb uh non-shaken versus uh, yeah non-shaken versus shaken so uh the picnic tap wasn't horrible like it's it's worse it's best was as good as the beer guns worse yeah you know yeah um it's interesting the funny thing is is the beer guns numbers 
those are in line with a lot of commercial packaging numbers. Yeah. So it's a good, it's a good device. If you're very good at home, you can, you know, uh, the most people in the commercial world want to stay below uh, 50, you know? Yeah. So no, that's great. Yeah. So if you're, if you're looking to, to package your beer in the, in the least, you know, oxidative environment possible, grab yourself a beer gun. Uh, They sell them at all the major homebrew shops that I'm aware of. So if you want to read more about our experiments on oxidation, as well as any other of the weird things that we're up to, you can head over to brewlosophy.com and find it there. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no.